I'm going to just set the scene a little bit here because there's a chap called Stephen Flynn who is the leader in Westminster of the SNP and he asked a question at PMQs that I thought was actually a really good question. So let me just play it for you now, a, sh a short clip of his question to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. This isn't just a plague on all their houses, this is a plague on this house itself because injustice goes far beyond just the sub-postmasters. Just ask the waspy women or the victims of the equitable life scandal or the victims of the infected blood scandal or the victims' families from Grenfell or Hillsborough. The reality is that when the public come knocking on the doors of this here chamber seeking justice, the government only ever answers when they have no options left. And that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? That, you know, whenever we have those scandals, and he listed a number of them that are still ongoing, that actually governments of any colour, and I, th I think Stephen Flynn made a mistake, he kind of just started to blame the current government, which is wrong. Uh, everything else he said, I couldn't agree with more. Uh, but actually governments only act when they have to act, when they're called out, in this case by an ITV drama. And I want to try and understand why, when we have one of, I know you won't all agree with this, but one of the most accessible democratic systems in the country, we find that when they are there to protect miscarriages of justice, you can't get much more serious than that. Miscarriages of gross unfair treatment that where it's starkly obvious to all of us, a system falls into place that shuts down the inquiry for as long, sorry, shuts down the issue for as long as possible, decades, as we've seen with Horizon, where people are worn out trying to fight for justice. But then for every campaign, Waspy Women, whatever it may be, Grenfell, Prima Dost, the one I mentioned of, there's an Alan Bates there somewhere trying to get justice. So uh, I tried very hard get someone from the SNP to come on, but they obviously thought talking to a wicked old ex-Tory was not going to be a good idea. Little did they know. But I am very pleased to say we got Neil Hamby, leader of the Alba Party in Westminster. Hello. Hi there. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, and thank you for joining me. I know there's going to be a wonderful temptation um, for us to get political in this, but I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to take the spirit of the first part of the question uh, there that you heard me play. It does yep. feel that once again we are seeing a witness where a, a system, a parliamentary system, a government system, a civil service system that's meant to be there to serve the people is actually a disservice to the people, isn't it? What, what do you, I mean, what's your assessment of the situation? Did he ask the right question? Let, let me put it that way. And I think the question was really important. I think the way that Stephen framed it was unfortunate because... Um, whilst uh, I don't disagree with him uh, on all of the issues that he's raised uh, 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 at all uh, and of the rather glacial speed of Parliament addressing uh, important matters such as this, he did give um, the Prime Minister an opportunity to, um, uh, you know, to shout him down for politicising mm. such mm. sensitive and important issues. And I, and I think that was unfortunate, not least because that similar charge can be levelled uh, equally against the Scottish government yep. in the way that they have dealt with, you know, we still to find out the detail of their uh, involvement in assessing the Horizon scandal. It wasn't devolved legislation for sure, but certainly the Crown Office in Scotland had a role to play in some of the wrongful prosecutions. Um, uh, but it... it, it, it attempted to create a distance from the SNP that they would never behave in such a way. Mm. And, and that's just factually untrue. And it's an incredibly sensitive issue in Scotland at the moment, particularly over the gender recognition reform yeah. and number of people who uh, tried, uh, and myself included, tried to guide that legislation away from some of the safeguarding risks that were so obvious to anyone with experience in that field. Uh, uh, and the Scottish government were deaf to those concerns and were ultimately defeated. But they have now reignited exactly the same problem with their so-called ban and uh, conversion therapy so, legislation. So and they're equally deaf to those concerns. 
Can I ask you, um, when, when death to concerns, I think, is, is really good. But, you know, we, the, the, the members of the public, mm -hmm. can look at a certain number of MPs who, who really can hold their heads up high on this issue. I'm not familiar if there have been any champions in Scotland over the horizon issue, or, or I'm sure there are on other matters like WASPy and so forth. But yep. a, a, a number of MPs can hold their heads up high and say they really did do everything. But if they cannot get a fair, legitimate hearing, um, yeah. what does it say for the rest of us? What chance do we ever have? Well, I, I've, been, I've been thinking about this quite carefully, Nick, because my, my previous life, my life prior to politics was within, within the NHS. Um, I was very fortunate to work at um, University of London hospitals, uh, at University College London hospitals and at the Royal Marsden. And I would say that certainly our approach to um, issues uh, where there was uh, uh, an incident or uh, a problem within the delivery of services was to explore that in good faith and to hold our hands up where it was necessary to the, the people who'd been affected by that and work to find measures to at least mitigate uh, or correct the the issues that led to to that disaster i'm thinking you know for example intrathecal chemotherapy was a a, mm -hmm. a serious issue a number of years ago and i was uh, heavily involved in the implementing the policies that sought to prevent that from ever happening again because that was a always a, a fatal situation and you think so, of tainted blood scandals as well and the thing, yeah i i have worked directly uh, in uh, haematology with people who were uh, infected by blood products uh, at, at that time. Uh, so I know, uh, I have a very close experience to, to how devastating that um, was for them, their families and, and everyone around them. Um, but there's a, there's a need to, um, for government, for large institutions like the NHS, to err when they start to think that the best way to deal with this is to limit reputational damage by trying to push it under the rug. Uh, what they must do is surface it as early as possible to appoint independent investigators uh, as early as possible. Well, let me ask you about that. That's Be the only way you can have good, robust governance. You see, I... I, can't, I do agree with you, but only up to a point. But, and, and had I been sitting in Parliament opposite you, I probably would have been going, absolutely right, you, you've got that uh, spot on, Neil. But in a way, the, 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 when we res one of the knee-jerk responses we so often get, lessons must be learnt, this must never happen again, let's have an inquiry. And yeah. that buys time for the key people who should be held accountable to basically disappear from our, our screens, the issue dies away, and, and we become a victim, if you like, of process, yes. don't we? Yes, and I, I, I there's another really good example, which I think is um, equivalent to the uh, Horizon scandal, which is the loan charge scandal. Now, this is something uh, that... Do, do briefly has... explain what that is, so we can have oh. some context. The loan charge is a scheme that's or, or the recovery of that, that that fund is a scheme that's operated by HMRC, and these are people who were paid through a financial vehicle, um, which uh, is suggested to say they avoided tax. But a lot of these were contractors from, you know, physiotherapists and other standard uh, employees, uh, and uh, the HMRC is now going back. Uh, many, many years into settled tax years, asking them to pay exorbitant, unaffordable amounts of money, and they have ruined many, many people. People in my constituency have been badly affected by this, but there have been a number of suicides linked to the loan charge. Now, this came before Parliament, I think, in 2022, and the Labour Party had an opportunity to support an amendment which would have forced it to a vote to at least write off some of these uh, crazy costs that are never going to be recovered by HMRC. All they're doing is destroying people's lives. And the Labour Party stepped back from that opportunity and the amendment fell. Now, I think ITV, if they're looking for another Horizon scandal type docudrama, that would be a really good subject to get their teeth into because it has devastated lives up and down the country. No one supports tax avoidance and evasion. This was not that. Uh, and certainly not on any kind of uh, and, scale that would uh, be a concern to the wider public. But people's lives have equally been devastated and destroyed 
uh, as a consequence, but the government is prepared to look the other way while that damage has been inflicted on so many families up and down uh, the UK. I, I'm going to ask you a question that I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is to answer, um, but Ed Davey has made a right fool of himself, in my opinion. I, I, I actually think he was guilty of not having stamina and not being prepared to challenge his officials, which, you know, is what we expect of our ministers. I, I know they get decision after decision put in front of them in their red boxes, and the relatively responsive, if you're exhausted, knackered, tired, whatever it may be, is just whatever your officials say, go for it. But there were circumstances around this that he should have pressed and demanded to at least have a meeting, even though his officials were saying don't. He cannot apologise. He cannot bring himself to apologise. You know, what is it about being a politician that stops your and my former, but your contemporaries, from apologising yeah. when so blatantly obvious these people deserve an apology? Yes, no, I, I, that I don't understand. Now, I, I can understand a politician who's not necessarily a professional in the field that they provide leadership for uh, are given uh, credible and believable advice by specialist advisors who are experts in that field. They decide to go along with that. But when the point arrives that you realise that you've either been ill-advised or misinformed and you've made a bad decision, then I think it is absolutely essential that someone in that position of authority take responsibility for it and at least apologise. Now, he may not be criminally culpable or, 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 or such like, but certainly it is his responsibility, as it was mine as a senior manager in the NHS, to meet with people who had been affected by serious incidents and events and to apologise for the distress or harm that they had in, suffered. Indeed, but then presumably you will also know there was a time in the NHS, maybe not where you were, but actually getting an apology was a really difficult thing to do. In that mm. case, for fear of litigation, I expect. But Brit, may I just bring it back, if I, if I could, yeah, sure. to, to the political environment. Yeah. To my mind, um, his, his apology could have been, look, I received this advice... I apologise, actually, that I got it wrong on this occasion and my heartfelt apologies to all those who were caught up in this. I don't think that makes you criminally liable. If anything, you're pointing very neatly to the legal advice, the advice you got, but saying it was my wrong judgment call. And yet he looks an absolute um, clown. Yes. And, and he's gone into hiding, which makes it all the worse, I think. You know, he's not been in the chamber during any of the debates, as far as I'm aware, certainly not when I've been there. And that really smacks of, you know, running away from a problem rather than tackling it head on. And, and if you can't face up to your own responsibility as a parliamentarian, what hope do constituents have that you will fight their corner? Absolutely. And be their advocate. It's simply, I mean, it's it's weak-willed, to say the very least, and it's unprincipled and, uh, and, and unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. Well, um, and Neil, Neil Harvey, MP, thank you very much indeed for having a conversation there where we didn't descend into party politics, but looking at the frustrations of, um, you know, getting the people who are elected and the state system that supports them to look after the individual's interests and not their own institutional interests. What did you make of that? 03444 991000. And how involved should the UK be in global politics? Sean says to me, Nick, stop talking about the post office. We've more things to think about, such as World War Three, maybe. Well, Sean, if you've been listening, we've spent a lot of time about that. We're still spending a lot of time on that. But forgive me, we just had a conversation about accountability, and I will never drop that as a subject. Let's go to Jeanette in Portsmouth. Hello, Jeanette. Hello, Nick. And what Happy can I? New Year. Well, Happy New Year to you. And what can I do for you? Well, I'm just thinking about apologies. I mean, when I was in front of house in hotels and uh, different companies, I used to apologise for things that weren't even my fault, simply to make that person feel a bit better. Yep. Yes. You know. Um, and defuse yes, the situation. I and I found, like, I live on the, um, I live in Portsmouth, but. The thing is, um, people just generally do not say sorry for anything. A taxi does, you know, doesn't turn up at the right time. There's no apology. And apologies make people feel better. And it's, 
it's costless, really, in reality. Absolutely. I mean, I, mean I, I, I know it was important, for example, for the post office um, uh, uh, people who were caught up in this to, to be proven innocent and, and established as innocent, and many of them will be soon, um, beyond doubt. But, yeah, you want someone to say, I'm so sorry, you know? Uh, the, the, it the, just the... makes that person feel a bit better. Mm. And also, you know, I think, I think it's corruption that we're dealing with, quite frankly. OK, go on, explain that to me. Well, all these people trying to avoid responsibility and everything, I just feel it's a bit big brotherish, quite frankly. There's, there's a lot of vested interests, is how I would sum it up. Yes, um, and than me. <laughs> and time, time will expose even more about this scandal. And, and I think the reason... It's caught the imagination because of a TV programme, but there's more to it than that. It is deep down, it's, uh, let's call it what it is, grotesque lying, playing with people's lives, causing people to take their own lives. It is grotesque at every level. And I think that sense of fairness we Brits have, perhaps more than any other nation, uh, and I don't say that lightly, I think we have that deep sense of fairness is what's at the root of the problem here. Jeanette, thank you. Lovely to hear from you.